Um, thank you for having us come speak to your group today. Um, I have to say, Nicole and I have been like texting back and forth about all the really great conversation and ideas that you have, and we're both um, involved in our own institutions, keep back. So um, it's actually been a really great opportunity beyond just being able to speak to you to kind of hear some of your ideas. But first of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm Jessica Bowman. I'm one of the pediatric cardiologists at Nationwide Children um, in Columbus, Ohio. Nicole, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. This is also one of the most efficient and like productive meetings I've ever witnessed in someone who goes through a lot of Zoom meetings. I am Nicole Dempster. I'm a pediatric psychologist here at Nation My Children's, and I work with families of kids who have congenital heart disease, both on the inpatient unit as well as outpatient therapy. So we're going to quickly kind of go over talking to kids about congenital heart disease um, and leave some time for questions, but also... Um, I do think this is a very, could be a very broad topic and perhaps if there is time at the spring meeting could be a bigger um, presentation. If you wanna go to the next one, Nicole. Yeah, we had a hard time paring this down because I think we could talk about it for an hour. So getting into 10 minutes makes us angsty. So talking about your child's diagnosis and I think um, as you already brought up, there's a lot of difference between talking to a toddler or preschool or early elementary school child and talking to like a teenager. Um, and so hopefully we'll start doing a better job of, of starting you off early about how to talk to your children um, and changing um, your approaches as your children age. But as far as some language suggestions, just talking about the heart like a muscle, kids seem to understand muscles really well. We talk about your heart is just one of your body's muscles. Um, and you can talk about it, you know, make your kids flex their arms and see there's a muscle there. You have one in your, in your chest as well. Um, and making sure kids know that there's lots of kids that are born with hearts that work differently from other, from other kids. Um, and because their hearts might work a little bit differently, they have to have treatments. They have to have things to make them, um, be strong and, and stay healthy. And whether that's surgeries or visits to their doctors, um, or whatnot. And this is a, a website where older kids that, you know, may want more of a, uh, a better understanding visuals um, can go to just to learn some more, more in-depth information about the heart. Um, obviously, as you all know, congenital heart disease is so patient specific, even if you use the same terms to describe one, one child, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the same as using those same terms to describe a different child. So it's, it's so tailored. Um, and then making sure kids understand it's not their fault. I think we, I try very hard to make sure parents understand that, but also making sure that kids understand that. And it doesn't change the way they love people. Um, kids, you know, automatically think their heart is what helps them be good people and, and love um, and that it's not contagious. They're not gonna, it's not gonna give it to somebody else. Um. So one of the things I find myself being a psychologist, but also just most of us as adults and parents, we talk a lot. We try to really, really explain things to our kids because we love them and we want them to know things. And sometimes I think when we use a lot of language, kids can have a hard time deciphering what do they need to pull out of everything we just said. So giving yourself almost permission to give it to your kid in brief sentences, um, even very, very like highly verbal kids still need it kind of chunked for them. One of the best things I learned early on in my career was from a family who was on the unit who had this book they made on, I think it's called like Shutterfly or something, where they uploaded pictures of their kid's surgery and then they could kind of follow along. Here was me before I went in. Here is me after my incision. Here is me playing and walking around the unit with my mom. Um, kids learn by books. They read books all the time. They're tell me the beginning, tell me the middle, tell me the end. And so having this picture with the language can be really helpful for your kid to kind of review over and over and over and make sense of why their body is the way their body is. Um, we really like to work on giving them the ownership of their strengths too. That's not all these things were done to you, but that you did a great job. You were brave. You were so brave and you took the medicine, you let them give your blood draw, and then we went and played. And so sometimes we can leave things on that scary moment when I want to focus on how strong they are, what they've done, and how it led to all the great things that they are creating right now. Another really think, nice thing to helping them find their voice and partake in their own care is learning to practice early talking to their doctors. Even at young ages, three, four, five, let's think of one question you want to ask the cardiologist when they're there. 
And by practicing that language and overcoming that awkwardness of asking a doctor a question, you're teaching a kid really early to be kind of a partnership in their own care. So they don't just see it as the place where I get my iPad and I play on it while mom and dad talk to the doctor the whole time. It lets them know that they're included and they're important. Just in talking about most strategies of when we're talking to kids, again, like using that chunked language, but also looking at consistent messages. So, and this can be really important when your kid's in the hospital and we are relying on babysitters, aunts, uncles, grandparents to talk to siblings, finding that we're using the same language across people because they are looking for those inconsistencies and those inconsistencies breed anxiousness or coming up with their own explanations or feeling like they're not being truthful with everyone. So it's okay to give language or even write it down for people. This is how we're explaining it. This is how we're answering those questions. And if you get fielded a question you're not ready for, say, that's okay, let's wait till we talk to your mom or dad to talk about it. Um, asking your child to talk about it later. So we wanna have these short conversations with kids, but then asking them later, hey, we talked about your heart condition. We talked about that upcoming appointment. What do you remember that we talked about? And this is when I have found I have learned the most about maybe something a kid has misheard or misunderstand about what have I said. We as adults, and I am very much to blame with this too, we explain, we explain, we explain, and then we say, you okay? You got that? And they say, yes, I understand, and we move on. But I don't really know what that means. Just like when we go to the doctor's office and they unload on us, and we might go home and have a couple more questions. So I think it's a nice way to keep the language going and the conversations going and showing them that it's not just a one-time thing, that it's an ongoing explanation. Um, helping your kid focus on what they control if some of the things are scary and making them feel comfortable and validating those feelings. So we don't want to just say, it's okay, it'll be fine, because that invalidates that true maybe stress or concern that they have. But yeah, that is a little bit uncomfortable. What question do you have for your doctor when you go? Or what do you want to still know about that? And so letting them know that they have a way to be a participant in it and that their feelings are okay. And we'll talk about their strengths and uniqueness a little bit on another page. Um, Jessica, just jump in if you want to, I'll talk forever. Um, but we also wanna just think about things that they will come up with at school. If kids ask about their scars or why you're missing school or why do you have a tube here? That is a really pressured point if someone asks you out of the blue and you're not sure what to say. And I struggle being asked for things out of the blue. So having your kid practice, what do you want to say to those people? What do you want to say to a friend? What do you want to say to a teacher? Um, do you feel comfortable if a teacher explains it to other kids or not? We want to give them the choice and the ownership to their body, their condition. And that also might change over time. They might feel this way in second grade and different in fourth grade. And those are ever-changing conversations that we just keep having. But the more we practice saying anything out loud, the more confident we feel when we're in those stressful situations. Um, a lot of kids like to find different ways to relate to other kids. Like I have a scar like here, just like you have a scar from falling off your bike. Scars just happen on our bodies. Um, what I have found the most in my outpatient career is that the kids are less focused as much on the scar and sometimes more on maybe like their growth trajectory or things that seem a little bit more visible to others. And that's okay to bring up. We don't want to often like make our kids feel upset, but it's better to be preemptive and talk about these things early so they're not faced with it without us. Um, I just saw on your PAC3 site that it looks like you've maybe already had someone who's come and talked to you about school and education and learning. But I think this is one part of their CHD that needs to be globally encompassed. So knowing that some children who have congenital heart disease may have some more challenges with attention and concentration or sensory motor skills or social skills. And that's just something to be aware of early and be open with the school about. I know a lot of hospitals now have linkage with neuropsych evaluations who can do a really deep dive on different functionings to delineate their strengths and also their areas for growth and partnering with the school early so they feel the most comfortable and again are owning what is important to them. <laughs> Oh, she finally gets to let me speak. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So physical activity and take this with a grain of salt because as you all know, cardiologists are as different as patients are. And so there's different ideas about what, you know, kids with congenital heart disease should or shouldn't be doing. And there's guidelines that are out there, but understanding that the guidelines are oftentimes not completely based in great data. Um, and so you have to kind of as a family partner with your, your cardiologist. But I like to think 
my job as a cardiologist is to make these kids know they can do whatever they want to do. And I want them to have as normal of a life as possible. Um, and so I early on, obviously there's some very, you know, there's kids that have to be restricted from certain things, but in general, the more we can keep them being active and getting involved is so healthy for them. Um, and I don't want them to ever use their congenital heart disease as an excuse. Um, Cause for one thing, when they get to be older, it makes my job more difficult to know if they're having symptoms because they're lazy or they having symptoms because of their hearts. So the earlier we can promote, you know, it's again, your heart's a muscle and we need to keep it strong. And there's so much else you can get from physical activity. We know that it helps with your stress levels. I mean, being a teenager right now in a pandemic and putting congenital heart disease on top of it, if we can keep these kids active and in a way to relieve their stress, that's so important. And it doesn't have to be football, baseball. There's other things that, that these kids can do um, that are still, you know, active. And, and it's like these slideshows, horseback riding and different clubs and groups. Um, but most of the time, especially when they're little, they can participate in the sport. Um, the one thing I will say is there are some of our patients who may not excel as much as others. So even though I'm often like, yeah, you should do it, they may realize that their hearts just may not allow them to keep up with their, their peers. And then we have to, to focus on that as well or try to find them opportunities to, to be able to excel in different things. Um, but I definitely think activity from the get-go needs to be promoted and um, continue to be a, an emphasis, especially in there are kids who that's just not what they want to do and not their interest. Um, but I hate to take that away from them, especially at an early age. Can I just put our emails up there that if anyone ever wants to ask us a question in private and doesn't feel sharing for a group, we're always happy to talk. Um, we only ran a little bit over, sorry. No, I think you're, you're actually the last session, so we're perfect on time. Um, I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, and this is both for you and maybe for others that have kids that are older. I'm wondering if anyone has any good books on CHD that they would recommend. Um, our son loves to read and we read all the time, but we haven't uh, done any books specific on that. I'm just curious if anyone knows if there's any good ones out there. And no one has ever asked me that. And that's such a good question. I wish I knew. All right, pack three should write one. Let's make one. All ah, right, there we go. go. Revenue stream for the PFAC, huh? Yeah. Um, I say there are books out there that I'm not, I just know families have told me, you know, intermittently that there, there's books and there's also, you guys have probably seen those little love and notes, like the pacifiers connected to the little stuffed animals. There's like a congenital heart disease one. So there's definitely those out there. I can't vouch for the quality or how it's, you know, written, but, but that I think would be fast. Fabulous. Yeah. There are a couple, but we haven't looked at them in so long that I don't remember the tiles. If I, I find them, I'll look and see. I'll send them out. But I do, there's one that I would recommend for parents. It's called, I don't remember the um, author, but he is a photographer that has CHD and he took photos of kids at different stages. Um, in their journeys too. It's called, I think, My Heart versus the Real World. Um, and so it's not for young kids, definitely. But I mean, I cry every time I read it. But it's a, uh, it definitely for parents and maybe for older kids, because he kind of talks about in the beginning how he felt growing up and then kind of reflects on that as he meets these kids at different ages in their life. I'll look up the author. I don't remember it, but I can send it out to the group. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And my other question is, what age do you find kids start to understand that, you know, they have something going on? I think I put in the chat, our son for the first time noticed a scar maybe a few months ago, and he's now three, so between two and three. But I didn't know if there was a typical age we should really start paying attention to this, or they'll kind of tell us or what, what the recommendation and experiences of, of you both are in the group. I would say probably around two to three is a lot of times where kids start to notice it. I think before then they go to see the doctor a lot, but that's kind of their normal life. They have nothing else to compare it to. Um, and so that's a lot of times when they start to see it um, and notice it. And there's some kids that are like, they want to show everybody. They're like, look at this. This is super cool. Um, but I will also say some of those kids then are the same ones that will become more um, embarrassed or, or shy of it. So just you know, even though your kid at, at five or six might be like, look at this, I'm a survivor, here's my zipper scar, that doesn't mean that when they're in their teenage years, they're still going to have those same feelings. Um, and that's normal. And it's not because you did, didn't talk to them enough or didn't normalize their feelings enough. It's just 
how their emotions and their recognition of others changes as they get older. Yeah, I think that's a really important point is that all the things we do in parents set them up for stage, but like there's a lot of other influences that we can't control too. But I would say definitely kids around the age of three seem to shock me at how much they can retain and explain, especially when we use really good visuals and explanations. Um, so I think it's a great time to start normalizing it and getting them comfortable with that language. Margaret just put in the chat about talking oh, about and I feel like that could be its own hour or longer conversation because I think it depends on how old the siblings are when your child is diagnosed with congenital heart disease. Like when did it start being a part of their life? Because um, that makes it even trickier. You know, if they were already, you know, eight, nine years old and then this, they have a, a sibling born, they might think of that very differently than if they are the younger sibling and it's always been a part of their life. Um, but I think a lot of it is, is similar. I, and I think a lot of parents are more worried about how do I um, make them feel special too. Um, so I would definitely, I'm sure that Nicole and I could talk about that as well for a long time. Yeah, I think that was one of the things in that the CHD Compass, the video project, that was the question that got me the most was the sibling question and how to, how to talk, how do you have the siblings fared? And, and honestly, it's, it can be a lot of good, there's a lot of good stuff with that. So I, that I'm, my ears are kind of, I'm, my thoughts are percolating there. Um, we had an educational session here and it's usually aimed at our Fontan patients, but we've had panels before where siblings come and talk. And obviously it's usually more teenagers just because a parents don't know what their kids are going to say when they get up in front of a group of people. <laughs> it just seems like it's a better thing to ask teenagers. And it is, um, it's amazing what these teenagers can kind of, how they can enlighten you as parents in terms of how, what they feel about their siblings, what they feel about their experience. So it might be something you consider as doing a, a, a panel where you have a couple of siblings. I think that'd be super helpful that for those with great. younger kids. It really would be because parents are really drawn to that conversation too, so. Yeah, yeah I'm enthralled. Like I, if that's the 10 minute version, I want to see the three hour version. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Like this, that was, I was just lapping that up. So yeah. I appreciate that because it's such a fine line of like finding special time but also like involving them so they don't feel left out too like they're still part of the family and they very much care about their siblings. 